Ik maak me hier steeds onveiliger. Niet eens zoals hier op straat. Ik vind de islam een achterlijke cultuur en ik vind dat ik dat zeg maar. Ik vind christendom in principe ook een achterlijke cultuur hoor. Ik maak daar geen onderscheid in, maar ik vind dat ik dat zeg maar. Als ongelovige hond. Ik remember heel erg well de dag dat Theo van Gogh was murdered. At broad daylight in the morning. In the streets of Amsterdam. His throat was cut, his knife was planted in his chest. I think he shot him, uh, went over his body, started stabbing him. And as he's stabbing him, Tia Van Gogh is saying, can't we talk about this? Not only was a knife plunged into his heart with a note, and in that note, of course, naming Ali as his next potential victim, but he was near decapitated. And that was because he, in some way, shape or form, criticized Islam. Everybody in Holland knew Theo van Gogh's position, not just on Islam, but on all religions. And uh, I think we, under, we underestimated the fact that he would be murdered the way he was. He didn't think of even taking a knife and stabbing him back or whatever. Just accepted, can we talk about this? He made a film submission with Ayan Hersi Ali, and the objective of the film, in my mind, was to highlight the Muslim oppression of women under Islam, gender apartheid. Theo van Gogh and I met in 2003. He called me uh, after the election and said, I voted for you, and uh, asked how he could help. And at that point, I was working, I had worked on this submission project. This was Ayan's idea to have an installation at a museum um, and she had already secured the space. And uh, Theo van Gogh said, why, why do you want to put this in a museum? We could do it as a film and we'll hide the faces of the women. And, and so we did that and he really wanted, uh, he, you know, he was used to provoking almost everyone in the Netherlands. He was a well-known provocateur but for him the project of submission was a project of charity to uh, the women of Islam. He understood um, Islam in a way that the other elite in the Netherlands, or most of the elite, did not. He understood that it was a force for evil and that it could really come and overwhelm us unless we push back and fight back. This is a woman who lived it. You can't tell Ayan. You can't preach to Ayan. You can't tell her what Islam is or Islam isn't or what it really is or what it really means. She was raised devout Muslim. She was a victim of its traditions and mores. Uh, and clearly, the movie was a way for her to communicate her subjugation, her oppression. I, I compared this woman to sun. I said they used as sun factories. Uh, you, you bring immigrant men from outside the country, you give them to a young woman of 15, 16, and she's only required to have babies, little baby machines. And so I wanted to talk about not just what was done to the women. They were beaten, they were raped, they were forced into marriages, they were subjected to female genital mutilation, all this in the Netherlands. And I didn't want to just talk about these practices and how harmful they are. I also wanted to address the principles that make the practice uh, widespread and that moves it from generation to generation and from place to place. Uh, at that point, when Theo van Gogh was, when submission was made, Theo van Gogh was killed, I had 24-hour protection. My, my threats against me started way back in 2001 and 2002, and he was killed on November 2, 2004, and I always argue that's because he didn't have security detail or the kind of security detail I had. 
I think that Ayan and Theo were aware of the danger. I don't know if Theo understood how imminent it was considering his last words. Theo Van Gogh's last words best express the West's sort of naivety, sweetness, and stupidity. Can we talk about this? I think, uh, can we talk about this uh, uh, is, is exactly where to start. as Muhammad Bouyeri has just shot him and is trying to behead him. And he says, can't we talk about this? That the, the West is in the mode of thinking that we can deal with these people who are absolutely intransigent and they will not be dealt with on a rational basis. They don't want to talk about this. They will not talk about this. They want us to stop talking about this. They want us to just do their bidding. Contrast that with Muhammad Atta, one of the 19 hijackers on September 11th, 2001. When he got control of the airplane that he flew into the World Trade Center, he told the passengers, he told them, stay quiet and you'll be okay. Stay quiet and you'll be okay. When he knows he's gonna fly a plane into that building and kill everyone on that plane and kill people in that, in that building. They did stay quiet. They didn't rise up and throw him out of the cockpit and uh, crash the plane like they did on Flight 93 in the Pennsylvania field. They stayed quiet, but they were not okay. They crashed into the building and they all died. Stay quiet and you'll be okay is what the Islamic world is saying to us now. And we're saying to them, can't we talk about this? And they're saying, no, stay quiet and you'll be okay. I don't find, sit down and please be quiet. And Islam is saying that, I, I don't find that reassuring. <laughs> this is a culture whose default position is just, you can't talk about it. So if there's a, a free speech problem around Islam, of course it starts with Islam, which is an intensely prescriptive theocracy. The fundamentalists have chosen their targets well, and they've chosen them wisely, because they know that if they stop that first chink uh, uh, in the wall, if it just that first little bit of the wall that starts to uh, um, come down, the whole thing comes crumbling. That's what they know, and they're not wrong. And so they want to silence any form of reflection or critical thinking on Islamic law, because if they do that, so many Muslims will walk out. If we stay quiet, they will see that they can get us to do what they want by means of threats. And that will mean there will just be more threats and more imposition of more Sharia norms until we are completely subjugated under Islamic law. Th this is why they immigrate also because immigration is extremely important for dawah, for conversion. Because it is written in the, in the Quran that, uh, that the Islamic law must dominate the whole world. It is a command. They are not doing jihad because they love jihad. It is written in the Quran, you hate the war, but it is command to you. Of course it starts with Islam, which is a, a highly controlling religion, the most controlling of all the world religions. It is forbidden to, to the Muslim to follow their ways, to integrate, to accept them as friends. So it, it, this is the problem. And Islam, in a sense, is using the laws of liberal progressivism uh, for a much uh, more... Uh, a much... Um, more profound purpose. Can we talk about this in the context of the Netherlands and maybe in the rest of the wider West? Can we talk about this means, you know, we are civilized people, uh, we can disagree and we should sometimes agree to disagree, but we don't use violence uh, to make a point. February 14th, 1989, when the Islamic Republic of Iran started all this off. On a very particular date, which is Valentine's Day, 1989, when the news came from Iran that a British novelist, Salman Rushdie, was sentenced to death, the calls for his murder by a foreign cleric, Ayatollah Khomeini, for the crime of writing the novel The Satanic Verses. Which was based on an incident that Islamic tradition relates 
uh, in the life of Muhammad when he got a revelation that there were three goddesses, daughters of Allah, who uh, were the goddesses of the Quraysh tribe that he came from and that had rejected him. Once he said that the, the three goddesses were real goddesses, then they accepted him as a prophet and everybody was happy until he realized that he had compromised his message of absolute monotheism and contradicted himself. So he went uh, back to them and said, well, actually Satan inspired those verses and uh, I was all wrong. I was inspired by Satan, which of course challenges or destroys his entire claim to be a prophet. If he could be inspired by Satan once, maybe the whole thing was inspired by Satan. When Muhammad was preaching in Mecca, and the people he was preaching to, the Meccans, the polyphasts, uh, refused to buy into his message. Those who mocked him and he re rejected his faith, he said, persecuted him. So this persecution mania that you see every time, Muslims being the victim, whether they are the perpetrators or not, they are always the victim. This is baked into the faith. If you reject Islam, you're persecuting Muslims. When Salman Rushdie published the Satanic Verses and the fatwa emanated from the Ayatollah of Iran to uh, have him murdered at the first sign that any Muslim gets, gets their hands on him to uh, make him pay for mocking Islam. I think it was so shocking to the world and it was rebuked uh, by Margaret Thatcher and, and Salman Rushdie was turned into a bit of a celebrity figure in the West. He was given around the clock protection. In those days, the West still had some understanding of the necessity of the freedom of speech, and there was quite a lot of outrage, even on the left. I think that was a strong response in some ways, standing with freedom of speech, but, but there wasn't a push back. The problem that politicians have with this is that this is, on one level, beyond their realm. I mean, from Satanic Verses onwards, this was about uh, novel writing. Uh, soon it became about cartoons. And George Bush Sr. was weak and limp. When the fact is, if we said, if he is harmed in any way whatsoever, this is a member of Western civilization, you're gonna pay a price for it. With the political lead, unfortunately, not so much has changed, you know. They are shocked, they say the right things sometimes, and after three weeks they are totally uninterested anymore. But people didn't think this was going to be a new thing. I don't think people saw that was the start of a series of events. The Satanic Verses affair uh, from 1999 onwards had a very interesting uh, uh, result. On the one hand, uh, Salman Rushdie stayed alive. He was protected by the British states on the order of the British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Um, but people internalized the fatwa, and British writers stepped back from doing it again. You know, they soon learned, you know, thou shalt not criticize Islam. You know, this is, uh, this is basically adhering to, to, to uh, Sharia blasphemy laws. And so every one of these events that ratcheted up fatwas against free speech, I don't think people realized at the time that that was sort of the first ditch in the battle, or the second ditch, the third ditch. And it's always easiest to fight in the first ditch as opposed to the last ditch. There's a fatwa and then there's something even more where even if the person who uh, puts a fatwa on the individual, even if he dies, it's still active. So he's still on the run. Uh, who knows how he lives his life. Salman Rushdie actually turned up on some uh, West London radio station one night and announced that uh, he'd reconverted to Islam. And the Ayatollah said, hey, good to hear that, but we're still going to kill you. Uh, you'll have a better shot at paradise, uh, but we're still going to kill you. And that's conscious, that they don't want you to recant. Imagine what any other group in society could do if they said, you know, they had a head-hacking unit somewhere in the background, don't have anything to do with them, but, you know, can't promise if you offend me. What they want is a state of fear, so that when people are thinking, uh, can I get away with this cartoon or can I not get away with this cartoon? Can I get away with this novel or can I not get away with this novel? That in the end, you'll abandon those kind of calculations entirely and just steer clear. The West capitulated. They basically gave credence to the threat, to the complaint of the Ayatollah and Muslims around the world. And uh, they were like, well, he shouldn't have written that. This is a timidity born of the Rushdie affair. Uh, the desperate fear that politicians, as well as writers, have that if they just go that little bit too far, 
that they're standing on the edge of a cliff and if they just lend even a little bit further forward, they might go over entirely. I've had that expressed to me by many writers. Salman Rushdie would never get to the fatwa now. He'd never have to worry about the fatwa because he'd send that book to his publisher and the publisher would say, uh, well, thanks, thanks a lot, old boy, but frankly, I'd, I'd rather not. Why don't you just do something about, say, three North London novelists uh, sitting around a dinner table chit-chatting? Uh, uh, that's much more our cup of tea. Don't bother writing about any of this Islamic stuff. That self-censorship, uh, backed up by the state thought police, is actually having a worse effect on freedom of speech. It is important that since we have millions of Muslims among us, that we know uh, their religion. It is very important. The San Bernardino shooters, the Garland jihadis, the Boston bombers, the Manchester bombers, and others have all been active in their mosques. What is taught there? Most of the countries in the Middle East are different. The Shia country is not a Sunni country. The Jordan is not to be compared with Oman. But they all have one thing in common, and that is Islam. And I saw that Islam, at the end of the day, Islam and democracy, Islam and freedom are incompatible. And I saw that without saying that all Muslims are wrong or non-democratic. I saw that the culture and the ideology they bring along was not there to integrate or assimilate. If you live in a, in a Muslim society, you, you know, the self, the moments of being self and with yourself are stolen moments. First of all, let's start with the belief itself in being a Muslim. It is, you're so under control. I don't know if you know the terms commanding right and forbidding wrong. So every Muslim is policing every other Muslim to make sure that they actually, they actually believe. Totalitarianism means that you are not allowed to live. And a Christian can leave Christianity. A Jew can leave Judaism. A Buddhist can leave Buddhism. But a Muslim is not allowed to leave Islam. The penalty is death. And it was the same with other totalitarian um, ideologies we saw in the last century when it comes to communism, when it comes to fascism. So I learned that in the process that Islam, even though it's dressed up as a religion, was more to be compared not with other real religions, but with other totalitarian ideologies. Now you tell me any society, Muslim majority society, or any household or community, where as a Muslim you can stand up and disagree with Muhammad's teachings. That's when, when I say there's no sense of self. If you have that kind of disagreement, you have to keep it to yourself, or you have to suffer the consequences of being killed, or hellfire, or it is, it is a religion of fear. As it were, taking the fundamentalists at face value, they have chosen their targets well. I mean, they've chosen them very well, because I say, go for Salman Rushdie, go for the novelist, go for the cartoonist, go for the newspaper, go for the only few people willing not to shut themselves up, and everybody will shut themselves up. In the fall of 2005, a, a Danish author, Kare Blutgen, uh, wanted to do a children's illustrated Koran, but he couldn't find anyone to illustrate it. Sort of like a child's illustrated Bible, he wanted to do that for a Koran. There was a school teacher who had a book written about Muhammad for Muslim students. It was his int integration project, and he was looking for illustrators. And he couldn't find illustrators. And so the story of him not being able to find anyone to illustrate it, because everyone was afraid of the wrath of Muslims, like, you know, uh, there might be some fatwa like against Salman Rushdie. So that became a little bit of a news story. And then as a symbolic act of the separation of mosque and state and free speech, a Danish newspaper, the Yilans Post, and said, all right, we're going to prove we're free men and women. We're going to publish any cartoon of Mohammed. And they wrote to all the editorial cartoonists in the country. And some of those illustrations were absolutely not negative about the Prophet Muhammad. They were, in fact, making fun of the newspaper that commissioned the illustrations. And there was no natural reaction to this. I mean, no one cared, really. But then some imams went on sort of a world anger tour, shopping these cartoons around in Egypt and other countries, trying to get a reaction. Again, there was no reaction. In fact, one of the cartoons was published in a newspaper in Egypt. No one cared. They were published in 2000, in the fall of 2005, and the riots didn't start until early 
uh, February, I believe, in two, of 2006. So these weren't riots. This was, these were protests that were uh, set in place. Because a Danish imam had taken them around in the Islamic world and added some really offensive ones to them, which had never run in the paper. Muhammad with a pig nose, like an imam Muhammad with a pig nose, was drawn by a Danish imam to make the cartoons look worse than they were. But he didn't get into trouble. Then the OIC latched onto the cartoons. They decided to make this into a means by which they could challenge the uh, freedom of speech. It wasn't until the Organization of Islamic Cooperation met in Saudi Arabia in late 2005 where it was decided that there would be a cartoon jihad. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation is 56 nations plus the Palestinian Authority. It's the largest voting bloc at the UN since the demise of the Soviet bloc. And so it essentially calls the shots at the UN. What they want, they get. And they are steering the UN towards basically bringing, bringing around a, a, a global blasphemy law um, against any criticism of Islam all across the Western world. The good cop, bad cop routine then kicked in with riots and killings of innocent people over these cartoons. And meanwhile, the OIC is saying, see, this is your fault. You've stirred up these people. Syria was fingered by the UN for killing uh, the president of Lebanon. And Iran got offside with world opinion on uh, nuclear matters. So both of those countries had a reason to change the channel. That's sort of dictatorship 101, have an external distracting enemy to blame. So all of a sudden there were spontaneous riots in Damascus and in Tehran, two countries that really don't allow spontaneous freedom of association political rallies. And they burnt down the Danish embassy in Damascus. And so these two dictatorships, Iran and Syria, used this cartoon issue as a pretext for, oh my God, we're the victims and the evil crusaders. And by the time February 2006 came around, there were riots around the world, including in Nigeria, more than 200 Christians killed in anti-cartoon riots by people who obviously had not seen these cartoons. I mean, they ran in a newspaper in, in Denmark. Many Muslims around the world still saying the root cause of this conflict remains unresolved. So the world awoke this morning with more fighting, pitched battles in the streets in Indonesia, in India, in Afghanistan, and beyond. Uh, this has been going on now for some 12 days. These countries that uh, allowed uh, their citizens to protest about cartoons in some foreign, faraway country don't allow their citizens to protest for, you know, when they have no water or electricity or the basic, uh, or freedoms, as you know, when they don't have the basic needs that a government should give them, they're not allowed to protest. But they were encouraged to protest against this. So this was all set up. And the West fell for it, and it largely agreed and said we have to, and, and the newspapers declined to publish the cartoons even when they were writing news stories about the incidents, the riots, the whole thing. And what happened then was incredible. I mean, uh, various Muslim countries' embassies threatened economic boycotts on Denmark. It was an international scandal. And instead of standing up to Muslim censorship, like the West, like Margaret Thatcher did in the case of Salman Rushdie. This time the West caved in. And uh, not just governments, but so many media around the West declined to show the cartoons as if they were so obscene that they could not be shown to Western audiences. When people say that drawing cartoons of Muhammad is disrespectful to Muslims, I say, no, you are being disrespectful to Muslims. Because if you agree that drawing, drawings or cartoons of Jesus or Moses or whatever is sacred to other people, uh, that those non-Muslims have the maturity and the sanity not to respond with violence, you are in fact implying that Muslims can only respond in one way. So those people who come up and say, oh, I'm protecting Muslims, they really don't know that they're engaged in the racism of low expectations. 2005, after the Danish cartoons 
controversy began. And by the way, one should always bear in mind how ridiculous it is we're still talking about the cartoon controversy. If you'd have said in 1999, you know, Douglas, in the 21st century, you're all going to be having a really big cartoon controversy. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? What? Walt Disney's gone nuts. What? 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 what what's the problem going to be? I can't. I can't foresee any. Your, your your crystal ball's gone wrong. You need to polish it. You know, it's it's nuts that we talk about the cartoon controversy and keep a straight face. Um, uh, but the, when the uh, cartoon controversy starts in Denmark, the famous case that the Danish Prime Minister Rasmussen had a delegation of imams and religious leaders who wanted to meet him and complain about the Jeanne's posts and cartoons. And Rasmussen famously said, um, you know, nothing to say to them. Um, tell them to go away. Uh, they're going to have to learn that Denmark is a free country with a free press that is separate from the government. And if they don't know that now, they're going to have to learn it, and the sooner the better. I think that's one of the most heroic, obvious, but heroic things of uh, recent years. And it wasn't done enough. You saw embassies burning. You saw people being killed. And that was the time that every newspaper and every newscast in the West should have run those cartoons because you can't kill everybody. Once they seeded that point, they, and it is the, it, it is the Western elites who are at fault, who have blood on their hands. They were able to go after Charlie Hebdo. They were able to go after Pamela Geller. Uh, they were able uh, to go after uh, Ezra Levant in the Canadian courts because not enough people shared the risk. And so those mass moments of collective cowardice, submission, and silence, I think, changed the Western culture far more than the attack on 9-11. And the thing is, so many ordinary Canadians, Americans, Europeans don't even know that that was changed because they just won't hear a story. Before, maybe a story would have been so shocking and it would have been reported, but now an editor says, oh, there's a Muslim name, skip it. People always say, you know, we want to open a dialogue with the Muslim world, or we must have interfaith dialogue, we must have dialogue with Muslim leaders and Muslim people. What would you be able to do to start this dialogue? Um, a cartoon's obviously uh, um, not, not, not a great start, apparently. So maybe a, uh, maybe a novel. Oh, Salman Rushdie tried that. Uh, we all know uh, what, how, what happened. Um, maybe you could um, write an article. Oh, well, Robert Redeker in, uh, Holland, in uh, France did that and had to go into hiding, uh, as, as have others uh, elsewhere across the continent. Um, so there's always this idea that, um, that, that, that if you just stop that happening, then it'll be OK. And they don't realize that the people who go nuts today for the cartoon will go bananas tomorrow over the book, will go crazy a day later over the article, will uh, um, go nutsoid and rampage in the streets when uh, uh, an allied power does something they don't like, and so on. You don't, you don't placate this. You've got to say, these are our values, and if you don't like them, you can hop it. But instead, we say, in the famous words of uh, Groucho Marx, these are our values, and if you don't like them, we've got others. What radical Muslims try to do is to make us fear our freedom of speech. And the response should not be um, to um, condemn the people who use the freedom of speech, but to show Everybody should have shown uh, the cartoons all over the world, every network station, every, every museum, every newspaper, so that the people who want to use violence instead of democratic means to attack the people who use freedom of speech know that it's without use to use violence because the reaction will only be that more people use it. And because we don't, because our political elite are really cowards, because most of the media are politically correct cowards as well, who are afraid to even condemn the people who use freedom of speech, the Muslims, the radical Muslims know and that it's very effective to threaten or to use um, terroristic means, um, which of course we should never give in to. Most people wouldn't know who you were saying if you said Molly Norris. Uh, in America, let alone in, in, in Britain or somewhere, I think that in itself is unbelievably sinister. 
Molly Norris was, of course, reacting to the cartoon South Park on TV, which was supposedly fearless. The double standards are amazing. I mean, you can do anything to Christians. You can do anything to the representation of Jesus. Now, I understand that in Islam, Muhammad occupies a unique position and is sort of, um, you know, not supposed to depict him. Well, good for you guys, but you know what? Christians find, you know, desecration of Jesus quite upsetting too. The South Park episode was interesting to me because, in a sense, it was a joke on the cowardice of uh, our contemporary media. They had Muhammad uh, behind a bear suit, in a, in a bear suit, and when it aired, they actually had a black box in front that they wouldn't show it. They wouldn't even, I think, say the word Muhammad. In, in a sense, they were saying, it might be Muhammad in here, or it might not be Muhammad in here. And, and so it's a joke on uh, our nervousness about showing Muhammad. And so even a joke about not wanting to show Muhammad becomes a joke that can't be shown. There's one group in society you can't do this about. And you can't do it for two reasons. One is that they might try and kill you afterwards. They might come for you. So plenty of people are, I suppose, fairly reasonably reticent about doing it. But the other one is that there is this, this army of cultural scolds in the left-wing media who will accuse you of being Islamophobic if you do. Draw Muhammad in any way, even if it's a heroic image of Muhammad, even if it's a blank paper with a dot and you say, that's Muhammad, that's enough. That underscored here again that the, the West will bow to violent bullying and Molly Norris saw this and thought that it was terrible and that's why she conceived everybody draw Muhammad Day in the first place. And she was right in thinking well if everybody draws Muhammad they can't kill everybody and, and she's exactly right. May 20th 2010 I believe she did it and she worked for the Seattle Times uh, I think a staff artist a staff cartoonist and uh, instantly she got death threats. This could happen to anyone, as it were, if they strayed into this area. I mean, I, I, as far as I know, I mean, Molly Norris can't have imagined what she was treading into. FBI advises her that she has to leave her job. She has to leave her home. So she just thought it was a kind of censorship of liberals issue. And she wanted to show solidarity. And so she, she said, oh, let's have everybody draw Muhammad. And she had no idea of what was about to descend on her. Imagine if uh, a cartoonist or a, or a liberal journalist or activist had said something about the Pope and was driven basically into, into hiding for that. It would be endless news. Um, it, there would be endless causes, there would be Molly's Law. You know, in a certain sense, Ezra Levant, uh, Ayan, Hersi Ali, Pamela Geller, all of us, uh, uh, to one degree or another, have understood what happens when you take an interest in these issues. Molly Norris didn't have a great deal of interest in, the, in this issue, she just, she just came at it. She's like someone who'd just been sleeping in a cave for 40 years and thought the free speech issues were exactly the same as they were at Berkeley in the 60s. And she sort of woke up from a long hibernation and wandered into it. She basically apologized quickly and the FBI contacted her and basically she disappeared off the face of the earth. We don't know her name now. She had a different name, a different... So she, she ran. She's gone. She ceased to exist. She ceased to exist. That somebody who is a, you know, I mean, no, no offense to Molly Norris, I mean, basically, you know, not, not a very high profile figure, just, a, you know, local paper cartoonist, uh, can basically be disappeared as a person, become a non person, having trodden into this area, uh, should be profoundly disturbing to a wider public. It's very, very sad. That, uh, that that's where we are now, that we have to enter into witness protection programs in order to take part in a national or international debate. The left just abandon you. Um, and there's no more colder way of uh, expressing that abandonment than when her own editors 
simply said, uh, you, you may have noticed there's no uh, Molly Norris cartoon in, in this week's paper. That's because, quote, there is no more Molly, unquote. That's how they eliminated her public identity. That there is, as in the famous line, that there is no more Molly Norris. Should, people should realize that's not just about Molly Norris. This is about them. I mean, if Hollywood, if, if strong institutions like South Park and the channel that publishes it, strong institutions like millionaire bodyguarded Hollywood celebrities at the Oscars, if they don't have the courage to do it, how could some nobody like Molly do it? To be uh, solidaire with her, you know, to stand by her, we actually need to do that. You might be on Facebook after breakfast, you might, or you might send out a tweet, and by the time your plane lands, or by the time you look at your phone next, you discover, you know, you, you've been the source of an international incident. And um, so cases like the Molly Norris case sort of have that terrible further dampening effect. You know, it could be you. It could be you without you really realizing what you're wading into. And the President of the United States, a man who defends covered women, the right of women to go covered, won't defend the right of an American woman to go uncovered, to live her life, to leave the safe house, to walk the streets. President Obama never said a word about her. A an American woman, an American citizen, has her life vaporized. And the President of the United States won't say a word about it. It's astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing to me. I don't understand how people cannot be outraged, and I don't understand how the left uh, can actually allow one of its own to be consumed like this. But she learned the hard way uh, that when these things go down, the left is not there for you. Charlie Hebdo was a, a, an incredibly offensive magazine and uh, in the greatest sort of tradition of satire. And uh, we have a Prize of Freedom of Speech, and we gave that to Charlie Hebdo the year before. And so, so I met with him, and uh, uh, I was kind of involvement. So when it happened, you know, I, uh, it struck me in a more personal way. This was a group of people who were doing cutting edge, uh, zeitgeisty uh, cartoons and, and articles, um, and actually had to move their offices one time previously because of them being firebombed. Um, in response to them publishing cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. It wasn't until after they had moved their offices they were attacked a second time by two Muslim brothers who had decided to take Islamic blasphemy laws into their own hands. It also changed my life directly because just a few hours after the, uh, the story that began in, Par in Paris, the security took me from my home and put me in the secret hiding. And um, that's been the life since then. And I don't use the word offensive very often because I spend my whole life trying to upset people. But it is, to my sensibility, so deeply and profoundly and genuinely offensive that we should be even suggesting censoring art, censoring people's right to write what they want and to draw cartoons. This is what happens when you don't have a culture of intellectual or artistic inquiry. Just after 9-11, uh, somewhere in, I forget where it was now, Cleveland or Chicago or somewhere, uh, they were putting on a play about Israel and Palestine. It was all totally pro-Palestinian. Uh, it was an anti-Israeli play. There was an Israeli teenager and a Palestinian teenager, and the play was all on the side of the Palestinian teenager. And the Muslim uh, community group still shut it down anyway, because the point wasn't that the Muslim girl wins the argument over the hated Jew girl. It's not about doing a pro-Muslim play uh, 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 versus a pro-Jewish play. It's about the fact that this stuff is beyond discussion. So we don't want any play about it. Which is why, if you've ever been, you know, in Riyadh on a Saturday night, there's not a lot of great theatre options. And they're attacked from two, from two angles. I mean, from... Uh of course, the terrorists themselves, which is a danger, but also from the political correctness, because they have pointed out that you're, you're, you're not a good 
human being. You're a, you're a bad guy. So, so, I mean, you have a pressure from both sides there. Because somebody somewhere gets offended. Somebody somewhere claims that their, you know, one of their religious figures has been so gravely ridiculed that the appropriate response to that is a mass shooting. Charlie Hebdo, you know, 13 human beings were massacred, slaughtered. For what? For drawing something that some other culture told them is forbidden. Not being able to depict Muhammad is not something that has always been there. You know, there are mosques uh, in, in uh, the Middle East that do have, or, or did have, depictions of Muhammad. It's another declaration of the supremacy of Islam and Muslims over non-Muslims, that non-Muslims must not uh, draw Muhammad, even if Muslims have done it themselves. So this is just exercising power over us. They are telling us, you cannot draw our prophet. The tragic element of what's happened is you have had snarlingly inarticulate bozos wiping out articulate, sophisticated people. That's what happened in the offices of Charlie Hebdo. Complete, bloody, inarticulate morons who can't win an argument have to shoot you because they live in, they in, come from a stunted society, stu too stupid to enable them to make their case. I was asked if Islam is backward. Pim Fortan, who was running for elections, uh, was saying that Islam is backward. Theo van Gogh and another Dutchman, Pim Fortown, uh, they're both ultra-liberal in a way, left-wing, gay activists, and in a way, they're, they're the, the ultimate canaries in a coal mine. And my answer was, you know, if, the, if you take the Human Development Report just published by the United Nations, this is in 2002, and they take these three standards, freedom, women's rights, and I forget the third one, I think it was maybe, uh, you know, free government. Uh, but there were these three deficits. And I said, you know, measured by these standards, by these human rights published by the United Nations, then yes, Islam is backward. So I was, you know, choosing my words very, very carefully. Uh, but on, regardless of that, it, again, it really doesn't matter. You, you can talk like Theo van Gogh, or you can talk like the Pope. It really doesn't matter. If you reflect on anything in Islamic law, Islamic political philosophy, you object to Sharia law. If you object to Sharia law, it doesn't matter how politely you do it. It doesn't matter the language you use. You are under threat. And again, it gets to Ayan Hirsi Ali's line about sharing the risk. When you share the risk, you, meet, you make everybody safer. When the risk is borne by a few people, you make them all less safe. And in the case of Charlie Hebdo, in fact, you make them dead. Because at a certain level, the cowardice of the rest of the media uh, is why Charlie Hebdo had to bear that risk alone and why they're dead. And the people that were murdered there on that day, including the, the editor of the, of the magazine, Jab, um, was, was somebody who was at the, at the cutting edge of saying, you know, there is nothing that we can't talk about. There should be nothing that we can't satirize. Why in the 21st century uh, do we feel beholden to any ideology or any uh, system of either government or, or religion uh, that it can tell us what we can and can't say? And, uh, you know, I'm afraid to say it cost him his life um, when the two brothers decided to open fire in that, uh, in that office and say to these guys, you know, we, we are going to kill you because of what you have done to, to our prophet. Um, there are many people, obviously, including his protection officers that he had been given in the past and all of his staff around him that had to die for what they believed in. But, you know, he was famed for having said, you know, I'd rather die standing than live on my knees. And I think the people that are willing to express not just satirical concerns, but real world concerns, about Islam, about all sorts of injustices all around the world, are living Chab's legacy. You have to fight for it. You have to exercise the free speech. You don't just, you know, believe it. It's, it's like, okay, those people who said, je suis Charlie, you know, holding signs up, that means nothing. Holding a pen up means nothing. Oh, we are Charlie was organized by the government um, who, 
who is part of the problem. And where innocent people are killed in the name of Muhammad and Allah, they go to find the first camera and say Islam is a religion of peace. You know, this, 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 this crazy, um, uh, almost reflex of political correctness. Co-opted into by, by the French government, by people in the elite classes all around the world, uh, was a sort of statement to say, we don't believe in offending one another, a, kind of co a complete diametric opposite of what uh, Charlie Hebdo stood for. Um, they didn't care about offense, they cared about the message that was getting through. So, the, 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 so <laughs> the, the, it, it, is, it, it was a wrong thing. Lots of people were very opposed to we, this movement we are Charlie because in fact it was recuperated by the government to protect the Muslims because they brought also the Muslims into it. But it looks like if the Muslims were threatened, well in, for, in fact it was the free speech. There is a movement trying to kill us and you are sanctioning this movement by pretending it's not trying to kill us. And I was raised in a Muslim family. How offensive is it to say that Muslims are somehow what more genetically predisposed to violence, more more uh, uh, snowflakey? You know, how what is it? What is this actual racism or actual bigotry that the left hurls at, at, at Muslims to say you can't handle criticism, so we're going to wrap you up in bubble wrap and defend you for you? The media does not respect Islam. The media. Uh, especially on the core issues of the role of women, the place of women, treatment of women, things like that. The media does not respect Islam. The media is afraid of Islam. It's a very different thing. And you saw that in the reaction to uh, uh, what happened after the Charlie Hebdo murders. Even people uh, amongst uh, Western Muslims, even people who didn't think they should have been left in a big pool of blood on the floor, still didn't think they had the right to publish those cartoons. And the uh, anti-censorship group was going to honor them and a significant number of writers in the West actually protested that Penn was going to honor the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists because they were saying it's offensive to Muslims that they drew Muhammad and you have to stop this. Gary Trudeau, the cartoonist, Doonesbury, I think that's his, that's his cartoon, where he basically uh, smeared uh, Charlie Hebdo. And I, I think that the terms he used was they're punching down, they're not enlightening the culture. It has no societal value, what they did. And that's just BS. Uh, truth is a value. Um, uh, opposing tyranny is a value. And he can't see that. Why? Because he's a leftist who wants to impose his own form of tyranny. And, and je suis, as a phrase, has now been co-opted into all sorts of different things. You see, you know, je suis uh, uh, Muslim, je suis, uh, uh, you know, Ariana Grande. Uh, one of the few people who actually supports Charlie Hebdo in practical terms. Everyone else says, oh, these are courageous, free speech. Can I have my Je suis Charlie uh, pen? I'm going, uh, I'm going to the Golden Globes with Helen Mirren and she's got a, uh, she's got a big uh, brooch on her fabulous uh, en bon point. And uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to have a Je suis Charlie uh, badge too. Can I have one? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, w w this Je suis Charlie thing you're all wearing the badges for. Can we have a look at what, they're so courageous, they're such heroes. Can we have a look at what makes them so heroic and so courageous? Uh, no, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna show you that. Cut, let's go to commercial. We can't do that. We can't do that. Pamela Geller is actually one of the, uh, the few people who actually said, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm like all seven billion people on the planet, je suis Charlie, uh, but uh, je suis one of the few people who's actually going to show you what Charlie were doing. In the wake of the Charlie Hebdo attack, where an entire editorial staff was targeted and many assassinated, American Muslim leaders, three days after, held a conference. Now, one would think, what an extraordinary time for American Muslims in the West to stand for the First Amendment and to show that we as a people, American people, stand for freedom of speech. No. Three days after Charlie Hebdo, American Muslim leaders in Texas held a Stand with the Prophet conference in Garland. And it was a conference to stand with the Prophet in defense of Islamic blasphemy laws in defense of the Sharia, 
against Islamophobia. What is Islamophobia? But opposition to jihad and Sharia. They held a conference essentially in defense of the ideology behind that mass slaughter. We stand with the killers of the cartoonists and in favor of Islamic blasphemy laws being violently enforced upon non-Muslims. And so at that conference, we held a peaceful protest in defense of freedom, protesting a conference standing with the Sharia behind the slaughter of cartoonists, reporters, and journalists. We had a very well attended conference. There should have been millions of Americans there. But again, they wouldn't know about it because the media is not discussing this in a candid and honest way. That time we learned that the Garland venue was a public venue that anybody could rent for events. Subsequent to that, I said, okay, we're going to do a conference in that same room, in that same center, the Colwell Center, in, def in defense of freedom of speech. In Islamic history, actually Muslims have depicted Muhammad and there are, uh, uh, there are hagiographical images of Muhammad that are in Islamic tradition. We had some of them on display, uh, some uh, historical images from the West as well of uh, Muhammad in the church in Florence uh, that where uh, he's depicted in hell as per Dante's uh, Inferno. To show that people weren't always being killed, that now if you dare depict Muhammad, you will be targeted for death. It is a violent means of warfare in order to impose Sharia law. It's the difference between um, Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or um, 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 the Islamic Republic of Iran or other um, Islamic countries in the Middle East and um, the West. Um, at least this is how it should be. At least this is, this is how still America still has and Europe we are already almost lost when it comes to also freedom of speech, but in America, I'm very, you, with your First Amendment, um, this is about freedom of speech. And we should, we should I mean, it was not done um, to provoke Muslims. It was done, like I said before, to make a point that um, freedom of speech is our heritage, is our most sacred right. I also, as an afterthought, said, any artist who wants to submit a drawing, a cartoon, a painting of Muhammad, we will have a, a contest to award the winner. So that's how Garland evolved. Herod Wilders is the leader of the Dutch political party, the Freedom Party. And he and I share very similar views on Sharia, on jihad terrorism. I know that he's the most honest politician on earth about Islam. He doesn't bite his tongue at all. He doesn't play games with it. Hello, America! He's a peaceful Democrat. He has strong opinions about Islam, but he's a peaceful liberal Democrat. He, not a violent bone in his body. Um, he distinguishes between individual Muslim people versus the ideology and the doctrine, the philosophy, the religion of Islam. And I think that's an important distinction to make. You can oppose an ideology and still be respectful and even loving of individual people. Um, Pamela took the initiative for Garland, Texas, um, at the same location where not so long after um, the Charlie Hebdo assassinations, Muslims gathered and I believe it was even the same venue, decided that um, a Muhammad cartoon should be outlawed, should be forbidden. And Pamela said, well, um, I'm all about freedom of speech and I applaud her for that. And so we should have a Mohammed Khatun contest on the same, at the same place. And of course it's ironic that the winner of the AFDR Garland Mohammed art contest would be a former Muslim. Bosch Faustin gave a very moving and affecting talk about uh, his upbringing as a Muslim and how he learned even in a relatively secular Muslim household, he uh, it was sort of in the air to hate Jews, to hate women, to uh, uh, have this vicious anti-Semitism. That's even being raised in a relatively moderate secular household in America with Muslims, but the, the misogyny was a given. It was uh, immoderate, the misogyny, not moderate at all. Uh, almost every female in my family was beaten up by her spouse uh, and, and brothers and father, of course, and uh, the admiration for Hitler and the Jew hatred. 
It was immoderate. It was nothing moderate about the Jew hatred. Jews were the scum of the earth, and that's what we, that's what we were taught again and again and again. And I also give them uh, a prayer scar, which is something that Muslims who are really trying to show off the fact that they really pray hard. They pray, they pray physically hard to the point where they put their heads into the carpet and they, get, they grow an actual scar. Because we always try to have fun uh, with these things and remember that we're fighting for the right and for good, for truth, for justice, for the American way. And so we had a big check like the publisher's clearinghouse for $12,000 that we presented to Bosch and uh, a real one as well. And I drew him the sword and I said, wait a minute, how about if I have him threatening me to say I can't draw him? And me simply saying, well, that's why I draw you. Because that's the only reason why I draw Muhammad. Because he says, I can't. Because Islam says I can't. Because Muslims say I can't. Again, as I put it off, and I've never set out, I never set out to draw Muhammad until we were told that we quote unquote can't. And now, of course, in light of what happened, could the selection have been any more prescient and, 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 and perfect? For my own security reasons, I had to leave um, um, with my own security detail. And um, I believe we were in the car. And uh, then we heard, we saw on Twitter, uh, and later on the radio, that in the place that I just left a few minutes ago, and something happened. With automatic weapons open fire outside the Curtis Culwell Center. The suspects are dead, and a police officer has been hurt. There are concerns the gun. The event was over. I was approached by a uh, media outlet. I don't recall which one it was. A Breitbart news reporter approached Pamela and me and asked us for an interview. And she was going first. I was standing right next to her and uh, waiting to be interviewed. The crowd was milling around and uh, getting ready to leave. The thing had just ended. And uh, then one of our security team hurried into the room, ran into the room, and told us that there'd been a shooting outside. And the next thing I know, I'm being carried off like, like a pocketbook uh, by a SWAT team member. And I was told that a cop had been shot. And you'll notice they did this with Manchester too. When the event was over, right after 7 p.m., is when the two jihadists, Sufi and Ibrahim Simpson, stormed the, uh, the Colwell Center. And the thinking behind that is, here all these people are gathered in a very large room, and then they have to funnel out through a foyer. Just like the Manchester Jihadi set himself off as they were pouring out after her last song, after Ariana Grande's last song. He tried to shoot the people as they were emerging into this foyer and out the door. It was a terroristic attack. Two people attacked a police officer and were shot and that the people were gathered and were not allowed to leave inside the venue. And uh, of course everybody uh, was shocked. And um, um, I asked, I remember my own detail and they, they had all with their ears and they thought what should we do, where should we go, or what should happen. It was total chaos. And if those guys were out there, a few hundred people walking out at the same time maybe, maybe 20, 30, 40, who knows, would have taken us all out. And uh, fortunately, the guy did what he did. It's a heroic cop. I wanted to draw a cartoon, get his name, but they have not released his name, which is good. Good for them, good for him. Protect himself. But I always wanted to draw something in his, in his honor because he saved a lot of people. All of the people were brought downstairs to the basement where from what I understand, because we were separate from them, and I'm sorry we were, because I would have liked to have seen it, they broke out in uh, the Star Spangled Banner and other patriotic songs, which I just thought was such a great American response. Uh, we should never allow Islam to shut us up and have a cartoon contest exactly in the place where they didn't, where they decided not to want Muhammad cartoons. Again, it was about freedom of speech because they tried to kill not only us, but freedom of speech, and um, 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 it was, it was a, a, a very strange moment indeed. One of the things the left does, whether it's in Hollywood or in the media, entertainment industries, you name it, academia in particular, is public shaming. And this has been 
one of the tactics of the left to try to embarrass and isolate people who express opinions. The furious reaction from the mainstream media and from uh, putative conservatives like Donald Trump and Bill O'Reilly and Laura Ingram in condemning Pamela after the event indicates that they really do not understand what was going on. To talk about uh, you know, blaming the victim, attacking the victim, she was attacked as the originator of this massacre. They said her event left two dead. Her event left two dead, as if it was just some innocent two victims who, who died. Those two were out to murder 200. They got what they deserved. So you learn nothing from Charlie Hebdo. I, I mean, it was striking. You want her to die. You know what? She should be put before Sharia court and tried. And She's found not a guilty, Muslim. Of course, she would face capital punishment. She's not a Muslim, Anjum. She's not a Muslim. She doesn't believe she what you believe. She should have thought of that before you she had this competition. You don't believe in liberty and freedom you know, and freedom you need to of learn speech. The you want to oppress her uh, over Theo a Van cartoon. Gogh and, uh, and Salman Rushdie and Hasi Ali. You cannot continue to go down this road and expect the Muslims to stand back. The point is not to mock Muslims or Islam. The point was to show in the face of violent intimidation that we will not bow and submit to the assassin's veto. The fact is, in that fatwa that was issued against me, my name is preceded by Kanzir. Now, Kanzir means pig. It's the word Muhammad used before he slaughtered, how many, I should, beheaded, hundreds of Jews. So to first say to the liberal media that this is not religious is absurd and obscene on its face. To blame me and say that my cartoons are controversial, excuse me, murdering cartoons, but murdering cartoonists is controversial. And it is the jihadis that made this a flashpoint, not me. And does anyone really think that these jihadis would have just been peaceful, uh, loving Americans? Okay, can of I come course, back to of that? Of course they wouldn't. I, I submit you to know, you that our all, conference all, saved... Pamela. Uh, no, I'm talking, sorry, I know you're used to stepping over women, but you're not going to have it here, okay? My conference saved lives because I understand the threat and we had enormous protection and the Garland police were superb. But those jihadists drove a thousand miles for this conference. Would they have hit a mall? Would they have hit a coffee shop like in Australia? Or kids. We must not deny Muslims that responsibility, that you are responsible for your actions and for your thoughts. And if you choose to kill people because they've made a drawing, then it's the responsibility of the murderer or, or the person they, who attempts to kill. And that, it's that person and his ideology that should be condemned. Uh, not the cartoonist or the author or the artist. We all understand that there's a right to offend. You know, they don't like the, the, the Christ uh, on the cross in a jar of urine or the elephant dung. We didn't like it. We didn't kill anybody. There's Holocaust denial ca ca cartoon conferences. The Jews didn't kill anybody. What is this uh, so, the, the low expectation of soft bigotry? Why don't we expect that from the Muslim world? In that sense, Why it's almost condescending that we would expect less. They know what they're doing is censorious. They know what they're doing is cowardly. They know they wouldn't do it for any other religion because no one else threatens them. So by saying, aha, you had that come and you asked for that, that's actually their way of saying, look how smart I am. I'm legitimate. My decision was not just, was not cowardly or moral. It was smart. And you, thank goodness you were attacked because it proves how smart I was. There's, there's something terrible going on in the Western media. What you did, you knew would be very provocative. Your keynote spoker, a speaker is an outspoken and provocative person who is obviously an Islamophobe. That is a clever strategy. It's a way of framing uh, legitimate concerns about, say, Muslim immigration or Muslim assimilation uh, into uh, and framing it into the language of bigotry as a form of mental illness, which is what these phobias are meant to uh, indicate. If you, if you can be hit by a car and tossed off Westminster Bridge to die in the Thames, if you uh, can have a truck uh, rammed through the main department store in Stockholm and die, if you can be at mass in a French church and have someone walk in and slit your throat. If you can be a commuter on the Brussels metro and have a guy self-detonate and uh, rip your legs off, it is not unreasonable to have a fear phobia of 
Islam, Islamophobia. Look at sociology, there's this term called uh, preference falsification, which basically describes what happens when you ask a woman if she's a feminist and she will sort of look around nervously and say, well, yes, of course, because it's the socially accepted thing to do, because all the social pressures are in that direction. Well, we saw what happened for the Berlin Wall, for the Soviet Union, um, when everybody's sort of pretending to stand in one direction, everyone is sort of signing up to the feminist thing, signing up to, you know, the right opinion about stuff, because they're so terrified of stepping out of line, because the left has bullied everybody into saying they agree, even if they don't. Who would decide what's good and what's forbidden? The jihadists? But here's the thing. I didn't make the cartoons a flashpoint. I point. understand that. The jihadists well, made it a flashpoint. that's flash debatable. Point. That's debatable. You are debatable. kowtowing. You are submitting. I will not submit. Submission is slavery. I will not live as a slave. That is what you I are asking that. me to do. No, 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 no. Yes, 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 it's yes. It's about understanding the price of what you do. How can you criticize Islam without being Islamophobic? How can you point out, to the, hom how can you point out the homophobia of Islam without being an Islamophobe? It's the same problem that Jews have in this one. Uh, how, uh, how the left wing in particular, the Jews, but, uh, but others too. Uh, how, how can I point out Muslim anti-Semitism without being an Islamophobe? You can't. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> Not possible. If you fall into this idea, then you'll, you'll get the name. You'll get the smear. But as I say, some of us like, like to fall back on what we used to call facts. All over Europe, politicians and the media are complicit in covering up changes that are happening to our civilization. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the State Broadcaster of Canada, has a style guide that says do not use the word terrorist, it's too loaded, it's too one-sided, only use it if you're quoting someone else saying it, otherwise say militant or extremist or something. I mean, it's just, these people aren't even hiding the fact that they are full out on the other side of the debate. It is now a conscious dishonesty. In Britain, we have a, uh, an outfit called the National Union of Journalists, and they have very strict guidelines on what or on how they report on s stories relating to religion or race. And they say, go out of your way to play down any mention of race and religion when the perpetrator is uh, an ethnic minority or a Muslim. At the police level, at the social worker level, at the political level and at the media level, it becomes easier to look away. And in fact, it becomes career threatening not to look away. Everyone sees it. Everybody sees the Markazi Masjid at the bottom of the road. Everybody sees these Masjid boys going in there and learning, uh, um, you know, horrifically literalist interpretations, fundamentalist interpretations of the Quran, right? Focusing on the paragraphs that are mean and violent and awful towards the unbelievers, the Kafar, the Jews, the Christians, what they call the apes and the pigs of the world. Everybody sees it. When you live in a place of 4,500 people, and in the 2011 census, 44 of those people were non-Muslims. Who's gonna say something? And that was 2011. In 2017, 2018, those 44 people have gone, by the way, already. So it's 100% now. Who's gonna say something? You're gonna rat your own brother out? You're gonna rat your cousin out? And then what's gonna happen to you? I agree, a cruel joke. Because if you see something and say something and nothing happens, you're a racist, Islamophobic, anti-Muslim bigot. But the people in San Bernardino saw all kinds of strange activity in the middle of the night, people going in and out, all this um, uh, contraband to make bombs. They didn't want to say anything. They were afraid that they would be called Islamophobic. And I will tell you that even if they said something, I don't think anything would have been done. I think law enforcement would have said, oh, those people are Islamophobes. We had a Home Secretary called Jack Straw who lived in his constituency was Blackburn. And his constituency was utterly dependent on the Muslim vote. So, of course, they bent over backwards to accommodate Islam. It's an obvious temptation for politicians. And it's an obvious temptation particularly to play the sort of sectarian card. Because uh, if, for instance, you were running in a very predominantly Muslim uh, constituency, um, you might well say that you'd like to outlaw, criminalize, you know, novelists or cartoonists. 
even to the point of uh, knowing that massive Muslim electoral fraud through postal voting was going on. And they never investigated this at all because it would upset the local community and they might no longer vote Labour. So it's, it's a combination of um, the more you import it, the more you are dependent on it, um, also politically, and uh, being very weak and politically correct and being afraid to tell the truth. Well, you see it happening in the Democratic Party in the United States too, by the way. When you look at the DNC convention ahead of your uh, general presidential election, you saw Palestinian flags flying in the audience, but you didn't see any American flags on that stage when Hillary Clinton was due to give her acceptance speech of the nomination. It took an, it took an, up, uh, 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 it took an outcry from people to actually get American flags put on stage at the DNC. These two parties, very similar in their worldviews, are both going down the same road. That is a road where you have a dependency on a certain people. You have areas in the United Kingdom where the entire councils, where entire council wards are controlled by strict and devout Muslims. Are they British citizens? Yes. But apart from that, there's scantly anything British about them. They take control of these areas, they take control of these wards, they take control of these councils. And they start infecting it with things like anti-Semitism. They start infecting it with, with a bizarre sort of Pakistani, Bangladeshi style corrupt politics. Look here in Rotterdam, um, last time, the second biggest city of the Netherlands, not so long ago in the last municipality elections. It was the Muslim vote who made the Social Democrats, the Labour Party in the Netherlands, um, the winner and the biggest in the elections in Rotterdam. So it, it, it became um, also a political force where people can vote um, and have an enormous influence. And this is um, uh, what you see happening everywhere. I did a tour uh, of uh, the Malmo suburbs, the Rinkeby suburbs, London suburbs, Yorkshire suburbs, Bézier in the south of France, uh, the Parisian suburbs. I went to Hamtramck, I went to Dearborn, I went to some other places around the United States, Brooklyn, for instance. A lot of these places are starting to show the first signs. I mean, in Europe, they're showing all the signs. But in the United States, places are starting to show the first signs of what I call no-go zones or no-go areas. And that is not to say that you and I could not walk through there, but it might be that the postal service won't deliver there. It might be that police have to go in huge numbers there. It might be that girls in short skirts or hot pants can't go there without feeling that they might get attacked or raped or groped. In Sweden, police are now forbidden from giving the ethnicity and religion of assailants in sexual assault cases. So there are no rape statistics in Sweden now that identify who is doing it. All the women I've spoken to in Scandinavia and in Germany, uh, in the Netherlands, there's a consistent aspect. They feel doubly violated. First they feel violated by uh, the guys who sexually assaulted them. Then they feel violated a second time by the fact that uh, the media and the police and the politicians and sometimes even their own friends and co-workers regard them as the problem because they're, say uh, they're saying something that does not fit the official lie. The interesting thing about the war on free speech is that a lot of people think of it uh, and think of free speech as something that, I don't know, writers do, you know, um, those of us who publish books and write pieces in the papers and so on. We, we are the ones who do free speech. And that is a fundamental misunderstanding and one that I think a lot of you are involved in because actually, I mean, free speech is something everybody does or everybody should do and should certainly be able to do. And a very good example of what happens when the war against free speech really uh, uh, hits is that people who've never thought of writing or venting their opinion anywhere, or never thought of writing in a, you know, a, um, a magical realist novel, never thought of drawing a cartoon about Muhammad, um, just in their work lives come across something and they should say something, and yet don't. In Rotherham in the UK, for 10 years, the authorities turned a blind eye to Pakistani rape gangs. 1,400 girls were raped because the authorities didn't want to seem racist or Islamophobic. Uh, Rotherham is a, uh, uh, an undistinguished northern English town that actually has fallen into a pit 
of child sex slavery where that is accepted as a feature of life. Muslim men abusing white girls because they were white and non-Muslim, almost entirely underage. Um, I mean, abuse of the most horrific kind, repeated gang rapes, unbelievable. This has been going on for well over a decade. I did an exclusive interview with one of the survivors, one of the victims. Those girls went to the police numerous times. It's not a question of nobody said anything. The victims themselves went to the authorities. They were ignored. I mean, these are not girls from, you know, the House of Windsor. These are girls from broken homes, understood. But so what? Is any life worth less than any other life? And the striking thing about this is the silence that you heard from the social workers, the silence of the police, silence of the Crown Prosecution Service, silence basically of every single one of the people who stood between these girls and their abusers, or should have stood between these girls and their abusers. All of these people were silent. It's a, kind of, it's the, it's a balance you have. You have the multiculture, the respect for multiculture towards freedom of speech. And um, then you have uh, white men's guilt, the colonialism, uh, and the Western world, and it's suppressing other cultures, and now is the time for payback. Uh, I spoke uh, to several girls who were kind of 13, 14, when they were just lured into this thing. One of them, uh, a, a young lady called Jessica, told me she was 14. The police kick open the door of uh, the, uh, they get a report, they kick open the door of the bedroom, they find her, her rapist in bed with her. He's a Muslim man. She dives under the bed. She's naked under the bed. They pull her out from under the bed. They happen to find her with like a little wooden truncheon there. And so they charge her with having an illegal weapon. She has like a, you know, I guess a billy club or thing that she kept under the bed. Meanwhile, her rapist, they let go. And why were they silent? The official government investigation into the Rotherham abuse scandal showed that they were silent because they were afraid of saying what was happening because of the religious and racial identity of the perpetrators and because of the religious and racial identity of their victims. This, this, um, this idea that free speech is, is writers and artists and cartoonists pouring unnecessary petrol and gasoline onto a fire is not true when it's about uh, um, writers and artists and cartoonists. And it's also not true when it comes down to anybody and everybody in the country. Because anybody and everybody in the country can be made to feel that if they say what is happening in front of their eyes, they are also pouring gasoline onto the fire. And they're not. These were the only people, the social workers, the council workers and the police, who were silent whilst hundreds and hundreds of girls were ritually abused by gangs. Those people were, the, not, were not fire starters. They were not kerosene match fanatics. They were the only people who could have put out that fire at its earliest stage, and every single one of them failed. And that image of the police car driving away uh, actually uh, was a consistent image for me when I talked to girls like that in Rotherham, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Sweden, the police driving away, uh, leaving the uh, young girls to continued suffering at the hands of their Muslim tormentors, or quote, Asian tormentors, as they say in the euphemism of the British press. They feared being racist or Islamophobic, are anti-Muslim, and so they sacrifice their young girls, which is exactly the same thing that you're seeing now with this widespread migration of Muslims into Europe, the Hijra into Europe, these, you know, New Year's Eve, massive sex attacks. More than a thousand German women ended up complaining about being assaulted, sexually assaulted, or even raped. Do you doubt that if their boyfriends, fathers, brothers knew in advance that they would come, to protect those victims, 
if the cops didn't. My point is, if you, if you deny people the official tools, they'll find other tools. And that is not a good thing to do. Those of us that work in media sometimes wonder why people aren't more angry. When you find out that the government and the media were complicit, for instance, in covering up what happened in Cologne on that New Year's Eve, when, as we now know from police reports, up to 1,200 women were assaulted by two or 3,000 young Muslim men. Well, I think the reason is they simply never get to hear about it. The situation didn't just happen in Cologne, it happened all across European cities. And every single police force in those European cities and every single media outlet were told not to discuss it, not to put it out into the public sphere. And it was only because a, a, a smaller news site broke the story they were then attacked as dreadful racists, an outfit called Breitbart. When we saw the news breaking in German language uh, on January the 1st, what happened, you know, we couldn't believe it. We had to look twice, look three times, look four times, like responsible journalists do. But we did look into it, unlike the other sides, unlike the CNNs, unlike the BBCs, who simply respond, this cannot be going on. Well, our response was, we, this cannot be going on, but we're going to have to investigate this anyway. And it took a day or two to stand this up. And I remember my colleague, Oliver Lane, bringing me the story. And he said, you know, I think these are the facts. And he listed me bullet points of the facts. I said, wow, a thousand people outside Cologne Station, you know, raping, sexually harassing, robbing, groping. That just, I, you have to bring me more evidence. And so we started amassing evidence and more evidence and within... 24 hours, we were happy with the story that we had crafted. We had followed the sources in Germany. We had, we had looked deep dived into what was being said in the local press on television stations in Germany. And this still hadn't broken in the English language a couple of days afterwards, still. And I hit the publish button. We fashioned our story and I hit the publish button and I held my breath because I thought, if we've got this wrong, that's it. That's the end of us. We'll never be allowed to forget that. And I remember continuously hitting the refresh button on my keyboard on a Google search for, for the term Cologne, looking to see if anybody else was picking it up. And slowly but surely, other news outlets started picking it up but based on what we had done. If you stop legitimate criticism, including of Islam now, then 30 years from now, this is a real mess. There's no doubt that um, the Islamic supremacists understand uh, that a boundlessly tolerant society uh, can have its tolerance used to in advance a very in intolerant agenda. On the one hand, why aren't people more angry about it? Well, because they don't get to know about it. But then on the other, maybe people are angry about it. Maybe it's just that you don't get to hear about it because the media won't report either on how angry people are about being lied to by the media, but what you have to do then is just look at how they're voting and look at how they're behaving. It was, it was I think, one of the most extraordinary examples of how, unless there are people uh, unless there are us, you know, we little people with our staff of 10, you know, really, really willing to, to go after stories like this, then actually some of these stories won't be told and haven't been told uh, over the course of the last few years. And that's why it's so important that people do what people do on our side from a grassroots level. But the people, and that is my positive news, the people are wakening up. Whenever you come into the political, it's different from the religious. The religious can be private. And when it's private, it's none of the society's business. But when you have a political issue, you have to have the same treatment as everyone else in the political field. And there's no difference. Appeasement emboldens. Appeasement, it's like blackmail. If, if you give a blackmailer what he wants, he will continue to suck you dry of your money or your time, whatever it is that he seeks. Appeasement works in the same way. If you appease an expansionist, aggressive, violent, bigoted ideology, do you think that the person who's pushing it is going to stop? What I do is challenge your religious political authority, which is something uh, which you can find everywhere in the tradition of art, for example. And uh, there should be no problem with that. Why should we have a problem here? Everybody must stand for freedom. If you walk away from this movie and do nothing, this movie has failed.
This movie is to compel you to, to make the case of what's happening because you, if, you're, if you're just paying attention to the alphabets, A, B, C, C, B, you don't know any of this. But your, your, your freedom is, is under siege, we are at war, and part of the war is keeping you disarmed.